don't want to disturb those. I have a bit of a cold, so I'm sorry if I cough. There are many, I'm an anthropologist, and I want to start by saying that there are many different cultural attitudes towards creativity. And I was educated here in these classrooms and in these studios, and I aspired to be creative. I aspired to create something new and original and interesting, and I desired to be recognized for it. Um, but in my career, I've ended up in, perhaps at one of the farthest places one might think, um, given my early creative aspirations. Today, I copy other people's art, and I'm not ashamed of it. <laughs> this evening, I'd like to share a story of how two very dead, unnamed painters challenged my very conceptions of creativity, and how the collaborative work that I do has remade my creative process. So I copy art. Technically, I'm an archaeological illustrator, which means that I scientifically document um, ancient artworks. Specifically, my interest is in the Maya culture of Mexico and Central America. Um, it follows then, given such a career path, that the culmination of such a career would be to illustrate one of the greatest works of Maya art, the Bonampak murals. And in 2001, I was doing just that. Um, I was painting a half-scale reproduction of the Bonampak murals with Len Ashby, my future husband. Um, but as we painted nearer and nearer to completion, we kept slowing down. Because you see, we were actually painting ourselves out of a job. <sighs> For nearly three years, we had meticulously painted every eyelash, every toenail with the utmost precision. I had found my passion in, my, in this work, not to mention my husband. But I had to consider that my career had already peaked. At 25 years old, I was looking at the bleak future of forced retirement. Because you see, the situation is that while Mural painting was likely ubiquitous at Maya sites. It is very, very rarely preserved intact. It's so rare that, in fact, within um, the general average is that there has been one well-preserved Maya mural painting found each century. That means the Chichen Itza murals were found, um, well, came to light through travel writings in the mid-19th century. And then in 1946, Giles Healy discovered the Bonampak murals to much fanfare. So uh, a woman illustrator, Adela Breton, illustrated Chichen Itza in the early 1900s. And Len and I were finishing this illustration of Bonampak. So there was really no clear next move. It was under these conditions that I received a call from a friend, Bill Saturno. And Bill had recently received his PhD in archaeology from Harvard University and was also unemployed. And he said, how would you like to paint another mural after you finish up with Bonampak? And I said uh, sarcastically, yeah, that'd be great, Bill, if there was something else for us to paint. And he said, I should really open my email a bit more frequently. <laughs> and this is what he sent me. This was the first picture of um, a very early mural. Bill had gone tramping about in the jungles of Guatemala, looking for sites with hieroglyphic inscriptions and standing monuments for the corpus project of the Peabody Museum at Harvard University. Um, and this, while well, this phase of archaeological research, I see some of my students here, is called survey, uh, it is equal parts luck as well as scientific method. And there's also a reason why it is often young graduate students or the recently graduated and unemployed students that fill these ranks. So Bill was out there, stinky, lost, dehydrated, deep within the Paten jungle. 
And he had just found this tiny piece of wall painting exposed by looters who were tunneling into the base of a pyramid. This piece was hanging, suspended on the wall, with the whole supporting structure cut out from beneath it. You see, the looters, they had actually luckily passed by this treasure in their hopes of tunneling deep within this pyramid, looking for pots to sell on the black market. So buried within an early phase of architecture, the ancient Maya had buried this painting. This painting was in situ. There was potentially more mural to be excavated. Bill had just found the first mural painting of the 21st century. So I was glad to be his friend. And he assembled a very small group to investigate the site we now call San Bartolo. We knew nothing about the place. We didn't know the size of the settlement. We didn't know the dates of occupation or the extent of the mural painting. The first expedition was purely reconnaissance, documentation, and emergency stabilization. In all, we were two archaeologists, um, one epigrapher, one wall paintings conservator, two workmen, uh, and two local guides, and now one artist. That first trip was characterized by the thrill of discovery. We were exploring a place that had been uninhabited for millennia. We were finding houses. We found a palace. We found a ball court, all covered in dense jungle vegetation. The mural itself was elegant. There were these beautiful calligraphic lines that were fluid and precise. And they were depicting these very stylized, yet still naturalistic, men, women, and deities. The colors were intense, as if though it was recently painted. And as we puzzled out the imagery in the small section that was exposed, it was clear that this painting was early, much, much earlier than Bonampak, and equally clear that it was a masterpiece. Yet, there is also this, this daunting sense of um, work ahead. There, there were fragments that were broken on the floor. And in the tunnel, in the, in the fill, and the mud of the walls, there were also fragments of mural paintings sticking out. Um, it was dark and close, and you had no idea how much more there was, but you got this sense it was broken and intact. And I didn't mention, but we were 25 meters below the top of the pyramid. We were a day's travel from the nearest village on a road that Bill had just cut himself through the jungle. So I drew, and I drew. And I drew standing on a bucket, or sometimes I get a ladder. We had to fight for the ladder. Um, and I used a headlamp, graph paper, a ruler, and a clipboard. And I was intent on capturing every detail. This is my drawing overlaid. Um, the importance of rendering this artwork precisely was palpable. The mural was stunning, but the whole thing felt like it could collapse or be looted the day after we left. So the date of the painting, we determined, was about 100 BC, and the room was likely to be used for about 50 years before the Maya themselves had buried the chamber and destroyed two of the walls in the process. And that destruction accounted for some of the fragments that we were seeing in the fill. This painting was painted 900 years before Bonapak. This was the earliest in situ Maya painting combining figures and texts that had ever been found. Project iconographer Carl Tawe recognized this central figure as a very early form of the Maya maze god. And this is actually using some pre-Olmec um, characteristics um, in the face. The murals overall depict ancestry and origin mythology for the Maya people from San Bartolo. So over the next couple years, the project grew. Entering the fifth year of the project, the San Bartolo team actually numbered over 200 people working at site. We had archaeology students. We had conservators of paintings, objects, and architecture. We had masons and engineers and excavators and osteologists, as well as soil and pollen experts. We also had cooks and drivers and people to do laundry. Um, and we exposed the mural walls piece by piece, meter by meter, each step revealing all of these new images that we had no idea what they meant. But they were the beliefs and perceptions of the Maya from this place. 
thousands of years ago. So the site of San Bartolo started to take shape. This is an aerial photo that my husband took um, of the jungle. The, the pyramid is right underneath there, and you can't even see it. But the site began to take shape out of this jungle foliage. We, we found the you know, perimeters of the settlement. We found the edges of fields and quarries. We found the houses. We found pottery. We found ritual offerings. We found trash heaps. The mural images were contextualized by all this information. We learned about population levels. We learned about exchange networks and subsistence practices. That means we learned what they ate. Um, here in this image, you can see my drawing of the painting I made overlay. This woman is holding a basket of tamales, one of the first representations of tamales. At this point, we had discovered that there was not just one mural chamber, but there were actually two others nearby. And it was around this time, after months and months cramped in these tunnels um, with, I can't even tell you how many bug bites and other issues, um, mountains of drawings and paintings that were still yet to be finished. My fear for job security just uh, like a, a few months earlier seemed particularly ironic. It seemed clear that I would probably never leave San Bartolo. I may even die at San Bartolo. I'm still working there. So at this point in the drawings, I began to recognize some patterns and recognize how marks were made. I learned how trees were rendered. I learned how leaves are formed. I learned how bodies are shaped. I learned how the painters like to end leaves and hair with a string of tiny little dots. I learned how blood versus breath is represented. I learned how soft fur and smooth wood and hard stone is depicted. As I copied each line, I realized that the painter was super organized, way more organized than I am. Um, they would do things like in, in an undulating line of water, carefully count out and space out the number of dots on the surface so that I could even predict the next line of 123 dots without having to count. I also realized that there was a precise preliminary sketch beneath this painting, and that the final painting nearly matched line for line, dot for dot, that preliminary sketch. So as I became proficient in this new visual vocabulary, I also started to see variation. In some areas, there were drips and splatters. While beads in one wall were made with a single stroke, on another wall they were made with two strokes. And this gave me pause. There was a pattern here, and in these variations, I found the actual hands of the artists that painted this mural. Now, the stylistic recognition of artists' hands is a traditional method for art historians to recognize authorship. That um, under the pattern that um, artists tend to craft diagnostic features, hands and feet, the same way regardless of subject matter. That gives you a way of um, matching these features. And at San Bartolo Mural, what I was seeing is that uh, there were two artists by the way they rendered hands. There was one who rendered hands like bananas and another who rendered hands like mittens. Aha, there's a, there's a point to my title. So here's the painter one is banana hand. And you can see the fingers go into these long, thin points. And they're, I, the fingers are often all splayed out, so you can see all of them. In contrast, painter two, a lot of the hands are grabbing onto things in that section of the mural, but at all cost, if possible, let's just not show fingers. They are hard to depict, so we'll just do little mittens. Um, when fingers are, when you do have to represent fingers by painter two, um, this painter represents them with very rounded ends, very contrast to, to painter one and fingernails are always included. I had a definite pattern. Um, and I saw these very similar um, differences in faces as well that match the same uh, banana and mitten hands. We have differences in the way the eye is rendered with the eyelash and then a low below versus this kind of top and short line below 
And then I found a third artist on the east wall, the wall of broken fragments. And you can see this almond-shaped eye and a very different type of nose. And this was exciting. This was just, it was crazy. There was actual evidence of actual people that actually painted this mural. And I plotted out where painter one and two were working. Painter one on the north wall, and painter two was standing to the left on the west wall. And um, then I had this aha moment. And here's my aha. In the northwest corner, the final artwork here is clearly painted by painter, by painter mittens. Here you have the fingernails right and the rounded ends, but there was the preliminary sketch and it didn't match. Can you see it? It's that tiny line right there and it is a banana. <laughs> I was so happy. So here we have this northwest corner. The artists were hopping over each other, working to complete the final art. Not only were they real artists, but this was evidence of how they worked. And here's the plot of, you can see painter one and painter two, and as I just imagine them reaching that northwest corner and kind of like jostling around and, you know, I'll finish this and you, you finish that. Um, but then all of a sudden I, I began to doubt. I mean, after all, I'm an artist who copies other people's styles of painting. To what degree could a hand change? Is there any additional evidence that could tell us about, more about the painting process and test this hypothesis of artistic variation? So I turn to the pigments and materials themselves. The entire mural is painted in just four basic colors, red, black, yellow, and white. And throughout the painting, these colors are consistent. Red is red is red. Um, the, the saturation may change, but the hue is very consistent. Yellow is yellow, black is black. So previously we had, we had a sample analyzed of each color to find out what its composition was and we knew what materials it was made out of. But in order to test the actual variation, what we need to do would be to sample across the entire length of the mural. Um, and that's when Dr. Caitlin O'Grady joined the research team. In 2010, she and I surveyed the mural once again using portable X-ray fluorescence sampling to gather data on the pigment chemistry with respect to spatial variation. And we were not sure what we would find. And we were really surprised going through the results. She had the results and she was you know, running, running um, the data. And we had these two obvious clusters of red pigments. We had actually two distinct clusters that represented two different paint recipes for the red color. Now these are visibly indistinct reds, but yet two different recipes. So she sent me the list of which you know, samples were in which cluster, and I mapped them out onto this drawing, basically. And this is what I saw. So circles are one recipe, triangles are the other they matched. They matched where I saw the stylistic hands of painter one and painter two. And then the yellows matched, and then the blacks matched. This just was so creepy. It was amazing. This, we, we, through the materials, we were actually finding the people who painted the murals. Um, in archaeology, it's so rare that you get to speak to the level of an individual in what you find. You talk in generalities and, and big phase changes, but what we're here talking about here are the actual two individuals working, painting, being creative in this space. So at this moment, three things struck me. First, as an artist, to share the creative experience in such a way, it was remarkable, but it was also really odd and it seemed detached, and it seemed strange. Second, these artists were all master painters. They could each complete the work equally well. This was not a hierarchy. This was not a master painter and, it, and their assistants. It was a school of painting, and it was a collaboration of equals. Third, that across my art, it would be centuries before we ever get signatures on my artworks. So this was a very different cultural attitude towards creativity. 
Yet simultaneously, this resonated with me. It was strangely familiar. This was how I had been painting all along. In copying a work, in, in my efforts to maximize accuracy and minimize interpretation, I had worked to paint a shared vision rather than my own. Working with these three ancient artists, I learned their ways to render beads and paint clouds and depict water and find a flower. This collaboration changed both the way I see and the way I create art. At a larger scale, excavating, conserving, documenting, and studying the San Bartolo murals and the site itself is also a collaboration. It struck me that for over 10 years, I had dedicated myself to projects where creativity was not a solo endeavor. Like mittens and bananas, Len and I had been painting side by side, finishing each other's brush strokes. The scientist analysis of the pigment actually informed how we mixed our paints. The workmen who observed soil changes helped us understand how the mural was buried. There's not one aspect of these projects that one could accomplish as an individual. All achievements grew out of a partnership. Anthropology and art are two disciplines, two out of many others, that traditionally have been the domain of the solitary intellectual. For example, archaeology is plagued with this ailment we call mycetitis. And that, you know what that is. <laughs> it's where archaeologists claim a site like this new territory they just conquered. Um, and the arts are, are much more comfortable holding up and celebrating the master artist, the Dale Chihuly alone instead of his team of glass artists, who he himself credits. The true archetypal solitary genius was probably always a rarity, but shifts in how we learn, share, and create are rapidly supporting collaborative work. Today, with vast knowledge, more equally available and at everyone's fingertips rather than in specialized libraries, one is better able to share expertise and work across disciplines, not to mention across space. And simultaneously, we develop greater field and technolo technological specialization. New ideas and creative problem solving more often occurs through sharing of ideas than through solitary work. We should recognize creative partnerships when they appear and support them. Returning to my new painting partners, mittens and bananas. In addition to a call for more collaborative thinking with peers and across disciplines, I also suggest collaborating with greater intention with the past. In our efforts to move forward and to solve future problems, we need to draw inspiration and share creative ideas with people from the past. I found these three ancient Maya mural artists of San Bartolo by studying their technique, by remaking their lines and colors. From this, I gained a new perspective on their culture. I learned about their attitudes towards art making and a way they organize themselves within their society. The third point I mentioned is the absence of a signature on the artwork, which certainly doesn't mean that these artists weren't recognized um, and that those who vi viewed it didn't know its authorship. But it struck me as symbolic. For me, collaboration is energizing, but it also means to let go. The work stands on its own. The work has to have that collaborative buttress beneath it, but it's often not necessarily in the forefront. It's not the same as having this weighty signature of tag in the, in the corner of a painting. Earlier in my career, I considered Bonampak and San Bartolo illustrations as my work, but I learned that they were never really mine alone, and I came to accept this. They were generated through collaboration with lots of other people, and they were a conversation with painters from the present and the past sharing techniques. And once they're published on view, they take on a new life of their own. New interpretation and analysis can begin. I urge you to put your work out there, untethered. Let it be adopted, changed, and used. Let it inspire and provoke others. Our current teaching model, this is my new collaboration. I have a lot to learn from this guy as well. Our current teaching model, this is looking towards the future. Current teaching model does not support this type of creative thought through collaboration as naturally as individual endeavors. We are hampered by a linear system of evaluation. 
Do we prepare students for collaborative writing that characterizes much of science and the arts today? Do we ask students to do co-authored paper assignments? Does the notion of being assigned a co-authored essay or a co-authored sculpture make you as students kind of cringe a little bit? We need room in our studies and our classrooms, labs and studios to blend boundaries of disciplines and engage creative process. We could, should consider places where we can step away from evaluating individual ideas and performance in favor of allowing spaces for creative thought to be the transcendent conversation and exchange that generates a new out, unknown outcomes. New ideas, bigger ideas, that are the product of many creative thoughts and actions together. I could not have made this art without painter mittens and painter bananas, and they could not have made this mural without each other. Thank you. <laughs>